for it. Um, the other thing I would mention about my normal day-to-day -day life that might surprise you is I spend a lot of time doing emails and phone calls, just like everyone else. You know, being a musician it ends up, it is is really being a business person too. You have to run yourself as a business, and um, y you know the the idea that we all have an agent who takes care of that for us that's uh, that's not nearly as common as most people think. Got it. Okay. So let's go now to take a look at Indre's book. Uh oh. So wrong. So the the book is called if I can find the right the right window. The oh, I happen to have it right here. Oh, you have it right there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How music can make you better. I have it also right next to me. So that is, <laughs> Let me see if I yeah, can. Yeah, it is. Okay, so how music can make you better. Twelve ninety five, wonderful. Tell us a little bit about this book, Indre, and why you chose to write this. Yeah, so it's it's a uh, it's a little book. It's the kind of book that uh, you see at opera gift shops. Uh, which when I I visited London um, before the pandemic, and uh, I was so delighted to see the book on display, and it was like the you know just such a wonderful moment. Um, and so it's written as as a kind of book that you should be able to digest, you know, in an hour or two, it's only 15,000 words. Um, and the idea is to sort of deconstruct the notion that music is something that has this hierarchy where you need to have a lot of musical training to get music. Um, it came out of, you know, a number of different places. But one one um, is that Oftentimes, when people find out that I'm an opera singer, they'll say something like, oh, you know, I love Adele or, you know, I love Nina Simone. You know, was she a good singer? <laughs> and I would say, of course, but, you know, how immediate, just because I have the degree, just because I have, you know, training in one particular type of singing does not make me an expert on your taste, <laughs> right? So what is beautiful to you that's a good singer. Um, you know, there are people who are terrible singers who are really great singers, right? Uh, because of the way that they emote and the way that they that their voice moves you. Um, and I think that that's really kind of important. And so I wanted to write this book to show people to demystify music, to show people that it's something that everyone can enjoy and that your taste is valid, even if you don't have a degree in music. Um, and the ways in which music can be used to make your life better. Uh, that was really important to me as, as we, you know, think about, um, you know, music often is, is, is sort of relegated, especially opera, to this like elitist world. But the truth is, is that there's so many elements of music that can improve your life in so many different ways. Um, but the real story of how the book got published is that uh, in my journey as, you know, a scientist and, and an opera singer, for a long time, as I kept those two worlds very separate, I didn't even like people would say, oh, you're a scientist, you must know all the muscles involved in singing. And you know, you must have this great anatomical view of the larynx. And the truth is, is that I, I don't actually, I'm not a, I'm not a vocal physiologist. I took a class in vocal physiology. It wasn't that interesting to me because I didn't see how it could make me a better singer because for me, singing is, un is the, the, the training of it is implicit, it's unconscious. So I can't, you know, physically move my larynx. In fact, the more I thought about the larynx, the more tension I brought to the larynx and the worse I sang, I'm already overthinking too many things. So I didn't need an added layer. Um, and that's just, and that's not to say that people shouldn't, shouldn't learn that information if it's useful to them, but I don't think it's necessary to, you know, be a great singer. Um, and so instead of asking, you know, how can science deconstruct what it is that we do as musicians, the more interesting question to me became, what can music tell us scientists about the human experience? And how can we un use music to understand ourselves better um, since it's this you know, tool that you know, has so many different uses? And to explore that, I, I started a podcast called Cadence, what music tells us about the mind, not what neuroscience tells us about music. Um, and I, you know, I, the first season was just an overview of sort of what, what this amazing things musicians can do and how they do them. Like, for example, I was really interested in how percussionists think about rhythm. How do they, how, how, what model do they have in their minds of rhythm and what can that, you know, teach us about, you know, how to get, how to be better musicians ourselves. 
in any case, um, this podcast was heard by a, uh, a, a publisher called Chronicle Books, which is a San Francisco-based publishing company, and they, they really liked it. And so they actually pitched me and said, would you like to turn this into a book? Um, and of course, I couldn't say no. That, was, that, was, that, that never happens. So I was really delighted. Fantastic. So let's get into it right away. So our first discussion will be about the theme, how do our brains turn sound into music? On page 15, you wrote, quote, music isn't sound waves. It's not in your ears. It's not on the page. It's in your brain. Sound can be noise in one context and music in another. The difference? How you listen and how your brain interprets the signal. Is it random noise or is there a meaningful pattern? Just by repeating a spoken phrase over and over, you can turn it into song. Try it. Tell us about how our brains turn sound into music, Andre. Yeah, so this is another example of one of those things where I feel like music can tell us something about how our brains work and not the other way around, because there's so many examples of music for one person that is noise to another. You know, often you hear people say like, I don't know how you can listen to that. That just sounds like noise to me. And for the other person, it's like the most sublime, meaningful experience. So it's not the sound wave. You know, other people have put it this way, you know, is music the notes, you know, it, it's not the notes. It's not, music is not an A flat, you know, music is not a C sharp. Okay, is it, you know, the notes strung together? Well, okay, then you just have the notes and you, then you have the space between the notes. And so like, where is the music? Is it in the space between the notes or is it the note? It's none of, it's none of there, right? It's how your brain takes that pattern and turns it into this meaningful thing. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to have Ian as part of this conversation, because of all the musicians that I've worked with, you know, Ian is one of the best that I know that who can take um, a musical piece or, a, you know, any music that he's playing and in very few words, make it meaningful to the listener and change the way their brain is going to interpret that sound. Um, and, you know, so often, especially in classical music, we just expect our audience to come educated, to know what to listen for. And when they don't, and then they don't like our music, we find like, well, you know, you just didn't do your homework. We, we try to make all these kinds of excuses. But the truth is, is that as performers, it's kind of our job <laughs> to lay out the context, to show people, at least give them a roadmap of what they should be listening for. Um, you know, and, and, and I think Ian does that really well. So I was going to ask him actually to um, jump in and, and, you know, kind of just talk us, talk, talk, talk us through about how you make the decisions. Like, how do you set this, this, um, you know, opportunity for, for meaning making uh, when you're, when you start to, when you come into a concert? Well, I'm so glad you thought of me because I've, I've been thinking about this virtually for my entire career. And, you know, uh, like you say, classical music has this, uh, it, it, it has a reputation for being somewhat unapproachable if you don't already know what you're getting yourself into. And to me, that always felt like it was, some, it, was an, it was an impediment for us who are trying to do classical music. You know, it should be just music. Music is music. It speaks to people. And so I've sort of made it my goal to, to try to break down that barrier. And I've found that, you know, just a very short interaction with the audience can help start them down a path of really understanding a piece of music and listening very deeply to it. So generally my approach is, you know, first of all, when you speak to an audience, you can't speak for too long. So I try to keep my speaking short. I, I don't always succeed at that. Sometimes I get so enthusiastic, I just keep going. Um, but, you know, generally I have an approach that's similar to what you would expect. You know, say you went to a museum and one of the tour guides or a docent was explaining to you what you were seeing on the wall. Generally, they will tell you three things. They will tell you what about the person who created it? You know, so for music, I say something about the composer. This piece was written by Franz Liszt. Liszt was a great virtuoso. He was um, one of the most incredible performers. People say that, you know, ladies fainted at his concerts and he was just an incredible showman. He could improvise all night. You know, that gives you a window into the, the creator, right? And a little bit about the context. You know, this was in the middle of the 19th century. Liszt was like the 
pinnacle of the romantic era in music and so you can kind of imagine this very flamboyant and passionate style in the music that's enough to give the listener just a little bit of their bearings you know the other thing that I think is very important is giving them an overview the piece you're going to hear is six minutes long that way they know it has a beginning a middle and an end and they can track the journey you know this piece is six minutes long it begins very quietly and delicately and by the end it is passionate and loud and virtuoso that way they know you know like the the roadmap and the final thing i do before i play is i will try to demonstrate one little element of the music something i know they will hear early in the performance you know maybe it's a melody maybe it is a rhythm like you were talking about percussionists have a certain rhythm but some little element so that when I begin to perform the audience hears that and then they in their minds they say oh he was talking about that and I heard it and that makes me a good listener and it starts a positive feedback loop so that you know from the beginning of the performance they're already on the edge of their seats engaged in the listening that's my strategy I don't know if it always works but it seems to be a uh, fairly popular in my experience. Ian had yeah, and I, Excuse me. yeah, I just I just want to jump in and say there are a couple of elements of that that I think are what we have learned in terms of what happens in the brain when people listen and listen to music that moves them um, that, that goes with that. For one thing, when you're listening to music that you know is composed by a human being, even if actually it was composed by a computer, you listen differently. So you engage your theory of mind areas, you engage uh, parts of your brain that are involved in figuring out another person's intentions and beliefs. So that's one way in which you're, you're listening differently. And so by giving people a little bit of these hooks um, in terms of what they're listening like so so Franz Liszt had you know was a virtuosic you know pianist so like should I be listening for you know examples of that here um, and then I can learn more about you know his own intentions etc um, the second part is the pattern that you're describing I think is really important too because the reason that you know if you if you repeat a, a phrase over and over and over and over again with the same cadence it can sound eventually like you're singing it or that you're you know it's becoming music for you um, and that is because your brain sees the pat you hears the pattern and assigns a new meaning to it and in fact you know patterns are what music is all about right and so giving people a hint as to what the pattern is just takes one layer of, um, you know, a potential obstacle to, to understanding the meaning away from, from the listener because they don't have to do that themselves. They don't have to go note to note and say, is this, is this a pattern? Is this a pattern? Is this a pattern? They just need to listen for that pattern that you've already given to them, um, which then allows their brain to sort of put it in a bigger hierarchy of uh, these other patterns that have meaning. So I think that that's, that's, you know, really effective, as you have learned from your audience's reactions. But even in terms of how we understand the neuroscience of, of music, you know, I can see the mechanism behind why that approach is effective. Ian, would you be able to give us maybe some examples of what Indra is talking about by patterns? What does a pattern in music sound like? Oh, I, you know, that's an interesting question. Let me, let me get on my piano bench here so I can perhaps demonstrate. You know, the there are so many ways of, you know, a pattern is really about recognizing something, right? You know, if you go back to the ancient, you know, people on the savannas, pattern recognition was about identifying threats or, or potential prey, you know, it was about hunting and gathering and staying alive. But for us, in terms of music, it's about identifying something that we can follow, something that makes it part of a story or a narrative. Um, so in the example of the list that I was playing, what I would do is I would try to find elements of the music that I know they will follow throughout the piece. For example, you know, let's just take the example of Liszt. A piece I've been playing a lot is one of Liszt's etudes. And an etude is traditionally a piece that develops certain areas of the technique. The word etude in French means to study, you know, so calling a piece of music an etude is like calling a piece of music homework. It's really, it's about <laughs> taking it home and working it out and practicing. Um, but this etude has a couple elements to it. One of them is arpeggios. An arpeggio is like a chord, but you play a chord all together. 
An arpeggio, you break up the chord one note at a time so that the fingers have to balance rippling up and down. And as soon as I say that, I'll play a little bit of this piece and you hear that arpeggios are constantly going up and down. So there, I've already set you up, you know, even though I've just started playing a few harmonies, your mind is already trained to recognize arpeggios as a pattern that's going to happen. And so it's like, it's like, a, it's like we're building a path that you're going to follow, or we're, we're starting a story, and you know what the theme is going to be. I don't know, is that a good example, you think? Quite good. Indre? Yeah, and, and so what I like about that is imagine, so if, if you have um, musical training, you know, that will be obvious to you and you'll pick up the arpeggios very quickly. But even if you don't, I can imagine a person who has no formal musical training, is not very familiar with Western classical music, when they first hear the list, it can sound muddy, right? They can have the sense that there's a lot of noise and I don't know what to follow. But just as you show that arpeggio, all of a sudden that gives them anchor points, right? It gives them a sense of like, oh, I get it. So this part is separate from this part as you go from one arpeggio to another, even if they don't can't articulate that in that same way, it gives their mind a sense of like, uh, of, of what to listen for. And then it, it doesn't set, you know, then I think they can start pulling together, pull, like pulling out sort of the, the details of the music that really is what we find super compelling. I think that the the mistake that a lot of us who who work with classical music or with opera and we bemoan the fact that oh audiences are declining, you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be that way, right? But if we make people feel stupid <laughs> because they come into the show and they don't know what to listen for, that's not an experience someone's going to want to repeat. Um, so I think if we just give them a little bit of you know, anchoring points and take away the sense that like, you know, they, that they're that they're not getting it, quote unquote, I think that, you know, they will find the same joy in it that those of us who have spent decades in the field do. Fantastic. So we have uh, Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. He has some comments. Lino? Yes. Uh, Ian, I support that uh... 100%, 200%, because every time I play my concerts, I also talk to the audience exactly what you are saying like that. Uh, and I, I even add a little bit sense of, uh, of sense of humor saying, you know, for example, I had a, a concert of all piano variations. And I said, at the end of, the, of this particular, of the Brahms uh, Handel variations, uh, I want you to tell me how many variations there are. And if you don't get it, I'm going to play it all over again. <laughs> so everybody's laughing. There's going to be a quiz at the end. And we are not going to leave this hall until you know how many variations there are. And so that kind of engages and relaxes the audience instead of saying, oh, my goodness, this is the Brahms Handel variations. Oh, my God, this is just a monumental piece. I will not be able to understand this. But it gives them a little bit of an, uh, a sense of relaxation and at ease and instead of putting this music in a pedestal as if something that is unattainable and un understandable. Uh, the other thing is, I, to, just to support what you both, Indre and, and Ian, are saying, um, especially with modern music, with uh, 20th century, 21st century music, people are very afraid of it, saying, I will not be able to understand it, it's all noise. And I said, look, you know, I, I will give them a little bit of a quiz. I said, who can tell me this tune? Are you familiar with this tune? And you know what? People would guess, hey, I know that, that's happy birthday. Okay, it's the same thing, except that modern composers just rearranged some elements of it, but it's exactly the same thing that we all are familiar with and understand. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And I, you know, in terms of like what's happening, um, you know, I, I'm going to put my neuroscience hat back on here to kind of explain why the listener will have a better experience um, with that 
first of all, the tension pulled away um, and the you know requirement to sort of really think hard about what they're listening for. Um, and when you give them something to latch on to is because you know, a lot of uh, when we're trying to figure something out, we're very much heavily using our prefrontal cortex, right? Our, our deliberate thinking, our decision making, like, you know, our central executive. And when we're listening to music that moves us, we actually use much more of the back of the brain, our sensory areas, you know, more of our emotional networks. And so if your prefrontal cortex is driving your experience, you're gonna miss out on all this stuff that could get picked up and processed by the back of your brain. But if you can turn that off, even with just like that, you know, example of humor, it's very funny, actually. I, I would love to use that again, to be like, you know, because, uh, you know, what you're acknowledging is that for some people, when they're thinking too hard about this stuff, it can be very boring to listen to this long piece of music if you don't know what to listen for. But that doesn't have to be the case. And it's okay if you don't, you know, get every single detail that a musicologist would pick up from listening to this piece. It doesn't make you any less. You take that, that away and all of a sudden they can just listen. You know, they don't have to like think and analyze in a way that I think can be a, a negative experience for some people. I think the, the best example we could possibly give for this moment in the conversation is one of those old videos of Bugs Bunny playing the piano because it had everything, you know, it had the great performance, it had humor, it, it had, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's just, it, Bugs Bunny was a great advocate for classical music, I think. <laughs> Yeah, and you can see the emotion, right? Like the emotion writ large. Um, and so, and also all of a sudden, yeah, you don't feel this pressure to have to do all of that work yourself um, in the moment. And, and so, yeah. Fantastic. So moving on to round table two, our theme is how can music heal our minds and bodies? On page 51, quote is written, before she was shot in the head, Gabby Giffords was a talented orator. But after a bullet decimated her left frontal cortex, she was silenced. Months of speech therapy brought painfully slow progress until one remarkable day, after trying several times to pronounce the word light, Giffords broke down into tears. Her speech therapist attempted to give her hope by singing, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Spontaneously, Giffords joined in effortlessly repeating the word light over and over again in the song. These types of breakthroughs are common and show music's magical ability to survive brain damage and degeneration. When you can't speak, you can often still sing. Indre? Yeah, so this is one of the, um, I think, most powerful examples of how music can be used not only as a way of compensating for injury, where some, you know, often like in patients with Alzheimer's disease, for example, if language has, has now deteriorated, they can still have a musical experience that they enjoy, but also in terms of its, its power to rewire the brain. Um, so we sometimes say the musician's brain is a model of neuroplasticity. Um, basically what that means is that we can see how musical training changes the brain in many different ways in terms of how it functions, in terms of the actual anatomy, in terms of you know, the, 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 num the, the volume of, of cortex in certain areas, but also how they are connected with each other. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that music is tied to emotion, which is highly motivating. And so you, know, you can have an, and motivation and emotion are part of learning. Um, um, but there, there, and there are another number of other reasons. But I think the Gabby Giffords uh, example is just a really poignant way of sort of pulling all these ideas together. So if you'll indulge me for a minute, let me just um, tell you a little bit about some of this work. So here's uh, here's the brain, um, and here's Broca's area, which is the part of the brain which we need in order to produce speech. Uh, so to actually get the words out, we need Broca's area. And that's the part of the brain uh, where Gabby Giffords had, had damage as the gunshot wound hit. This other part of the brain, Wernicke's area, is where we understand speech, where we make sense of speech. So we call it the language comprehension area. Notice it's right next to primary auditory area, so where our hearing comes in. So it's right there, it, it, we process the speech. 
um, so we understand it. And then we have this fiber tract of um, neural connections that go from Wernicke's area to Broca's area um, so that we can prepare an answer. And then Broca's area is right next to primary motor cortex, which is where we control the muscles involved in speech production. So here's this beautiful fiber tract called the arcuate fasciculus that joins Wernicke's and Broca's areas. And for most of us, language is left lateralized. Even if you're left-handed, um, most left-handers even have language functions on the, in the left hemisphere. But we have an arcuate fasciculus on both sides of the brain. It's just in most of us, it's thicker on the left um, because of language. But if you're a musician, <laughs> Practice and experience can um, increase the volume of the arcuate fasciculus and make it thicker. Um, so here's a, an example of how much the volume of the arcuate fasciculus in non-musicians. So here's the left. You can see that for most people, the left is bigger than the right. Um, and then if you add musicians, um, let's just look at the instrumentalists. So these striped bars. Um, they have about the same thickness on the left, but they have much more on the right. And if you think about what a musician needs to do in order to produce music, they need to hear the music in their head and they need to express it. And that's what's happening in the right hemisphere where you've got this analogous area where you're understanding or you're coming up with a, a, you know, an idea and then you need to send that information to the part of the brain that can uh, you know, then initiate the movement to make it, that's on the right. Um, but singers, in addition to having a you know, thicker right uh, arcuate fasciculus, they also have a thicker left arcuate fasciculus because what they're doing is singing words. Um, so we can see this direct influence of practice and training um, and skill development on the anatomy of the brain. Well, what's wonderful is that in order, um, it, you know, in Gabby Gifford's case and a lot of other cases, her right arcuate fasciculus was not impaired. It was not damaged. The, the damage was only on the left. So she could actually sing phrases that she couldn't say. And there's a type of music therapy that's very successful called melodic intonation therapy that takes advantage of this. So what they do is the therapist will actually teach you little tiny musical phrases. So I love you and you clap at the same time as you're doing it so that you make sure that there's a rhythm because that's obviously an important part of music. And so you, you teach very slowly um, these kinds of phrases that the person might wanna say, you teach them to sing them. And they are able to do that much more quickly than they are to say it. And here's the beautiful um, you know, part is that, is that through melodic intonation therapy, Gabby Giffords has now been able to give speeches again. Um, and in fact, she recently gave a speech uh, and the way that she was able to get over some of the difficult phrases was by singing them in her head. And when you listen to her speech, you can kind of hear her sort of sing some of these phrases. But what's nice is that when we look at the neuroanatomy of these patients, after they've gone through this intonation-based speech therapy, here's, here's their arcuate fasciculus beforehand. Um, and here it is afterwards, we see a thickening it is thicker after training. Um, so that's an example of how music can literally rewire your brain after injury and give you back some of the abilities that you lost. So Indre, in getting back to the idea of those patterns that Ian was showing us and uh, general music practice, does that, they always say that, you know, if you, if you work out, you're gonna build a muscle. So it really is true that when you think then you're going to build brain power. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And we see this all the time in, in musicians' brains. So, you know, people like, so when you compare um, people who improvise more versus less, so, um, you know, whether you're comparing jazz musicians with classical musicians or even classical musicians who improvise more than um, classical musicians who, who do more interpretation work, you see differences and you see, you see the, the, um, you know, the marks of training uh, across the brain in, in many different ways. Um, and because musicians happen to be highly motivated and, uh, you know, they spend a lot of time practicing, they are great examples of how this kind of, you know, we can, we can, we can track it and see it in their brains. And does it even prevent 
diseases such as Alzheimer's if you're working out uh, your brain, so to speak? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, you know, Alzheimer's disease is such a fascinating condition for a number of reasons that we don't understand. Um, and there are, you know, I don't think that we have a really clear view of exactly what leads to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, because let me give you an example. There was, um, there was a nun that was part of a big, it's called the nun study, um, where they looked at nuns uh, over time because nuns have a pretty, in this particular order, they all lived the same life. They didn't have kids. They didn't drink alcohol. Uh, you know, they had, they had a very similar life experience because a lot of them started out in their, in their twenties when they, in, in the order. And so that takes a lot of the variability out of the picture. And in this particular order of nuns, they also allowed um, the scientists to test them cognitively every year to look at their, you know, brain scans, et cetera. And then when they died to do an autopsy. And there was one nun, Sister Mary, who was this, you know, whippersnapper, tiny woman. She lived to be 102 or 104. You know, she taught math up until her 90s. She, you know, she was the leader in the order. She was, you know, her cognitive scores were very high all the way up until she died. And so they thought, let's look at her brain because clearly we can see evidence of, you know, what she did to stave off all of this, you know, potential degeneration. Her brain was riddled with Alzheimer's. It was smaller than uh, expected. It had all kinds of plaques and tangles. It was an Alzheimer's disease brain. And whatever she did in her life prevented the symptoms from interfering with, with, with you know, why she had symptoms. Now, that's not gonna be, it's not like you can think your way out of Alzheimer's disease, right? Cause the side, you know, the, the, that's, the, that's too simplistic. We don't know why she was protected from the symptoms of what was going on in her brain. Maybe it was that she was in this environment, which was low stress. She didn't have to worry about money. She didn't have to worry about kids. She didn't have to, you know, maybe that's part of it. Another part of it could be sleep. So we know that what happens during sleep is that the brain washes all the, you know, metabolic byproducts of the day's activities away. And if you have sleep disruptions, you don't do that as well. And they start to build up and that's where you can have some of these misfolded proteins. But um, is it because the brain, but you need the brain to put yourself to sleep. So is it a deteriorating brain that's impairing your sleep or is it that your sleep impairment is deteriorating your brain? I mean, there's a lot of questions here that we don't know. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't say for sure. We don't know for sure what, what, um, protective effect, you know, playing music, uh, participating in music making can have um, on neurodegeneration, but we do know that it can help a lot. And in fact, that it can stave off. Um, so some of the other work that I can show you, um, uh, you know, basically shows that people who listen to music who have Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment perform better on memory tests, even hours later. Um, so there does seem to be you know, something there, I suspect it probably has to do with um, a sense of control and connection. Uh, because I think when you have a degenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease, you don't have a lot of control over your environment and you can feel very isolated, um, especially if everyone's trying to communicate with you using language and you don't understand what they're saying anymore. This is where music can have a real impact where it can make you, it can, it can give you control over your environment because you can choose to listen to the music or play the music or not. Um, and also it can connect you with people and it can make you feel like you are, you know, part of the conversation again, as opposed to someone who's just looking out from the outside. Understood. So uh, we have a, another comment from Lino Rivera, Professor Rivera. Yes, I mean, I am just very amazed, Indre, uh, of this research. Um, I did not know this until you showed it right now. Uh, and my lament is that uh, in our school system, music and the arts are the first to go. To, the first to be cut is the least important stuff. And with how can we make our educators and our politicians and policymakers know this, that this is very integral and important in our society and a service of our citizens. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was just pulling up. I'm going to put this in the chat. So I totally agree with what you're saying. And so I wrote a white paper 
<laughs> about this, um, which is to be used by parents or schools or educators to convince people that music education is incredibly important. But there are a couple things to think about. One, um, how the music education happens is critical because an ineffective music program in a school is a waste of money. <laughs> and there are better and, and worse programs out there. Two, the students have to participate in the music making. It is not enough for them to listen passively. That's not where the changes happen. The changes happen in active participation. And three, it's a financial argument because music programs make kids more likely to come to school. If they come to school, they stay out of jail. If they stay out of jail, one kid pays for a, a 10 years of a music teacher's salary, right? So I'm trying to make it an economic argument. Um, and we're trying to you know, show people that this is actually gonna help the school, it's gonna help the community, and it's gonna essentially make economic sense in the long term um, because music has both cognitive and social benefits. And in fact, the students that benefit the most are the ones who are the most at risk because students who are less at risk have parents who recognize the importance of music education and pay for music lessons or other ways in which students can get involved in music. But students, but parents who can't afford that don't. And those are the students that benefit the most. Just like, you know, there are studies of, you know, giving kids fish oil pills, um, you know, does that going to make kids smarter? Well, it makes kids smarter if they're malnourished. It doesn't doesn't make any difference to the kids who already you know have enough food to eat. But if you don't have enough food to eat and you're coming into class and you're hungry, then taking these vitamin supplements will make a measurable improvement on your your learning. So it's the same thing with music for those kids who need it the most and that are the most likely to not get it because they are being cut from public schools that's where the benefits really are. And so I think we have to make it a financial argument <laughs> um, because the, you know, the, the data have been there for a while now that this, that this works you know, in, in terms of cognitive um, achievement. So I hope uh, Ian will forgive me for going on to our next round table, but we're running out of time. So <laughs> our round table three, the theme is how can music make society better? On page 87 is written, music is almost always social except on the rare occasions when the composer, performer, and intended listener are all the same person. And music can be powerful social glue, bringing people together in rituals, ceremonies, marches, protests, concerts, and more. One way music binds people together is by harnessing empathy. When you listen to music that moves you, the activation in your brain mimics what is happening in the performer's brains. This mirroring underlies our ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to empathize. And playing music with others makes kids more empathetic. The overlap between the brains of listeners and performers isn't just in areas that process sound. We also see comparable activation in the anterior insula. Indre, in, anterior insula? That's not part of my vocabulary. What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, the anterior insula is such an interesting part of the brain. It's essentially where your awareness of yourself is. So your sense that you are a separate entity, um, but that also you, you know, it's where you feel your body, like, you know, it's, and, and, and where you know where your body is in space, but also how you um, sort of interact with the world. So also there's, there's a, the sense of taste is actually localized to the insula. And that's why when someone has a political view that we don't agree with, we say we're disgusted. We literally get nauseous because these things are related because we have set up our own mental model of our value system as who, who we are. And when someone, you know, uh, comes into con conflict with that, we literally feel disgusted. Um, so the insula is, is, a, is a really interesting, really important brain area in terms of what makes us human. Um, and the reason that I, I really, you know, in some ways we've given you this teaser of this list etude and I, you know, this, it was intentional because what I really want now is for us to listen to Ian play the piece um, and, and track how, now that we know Ian, now that we know a little bit about the composer, now that we know a little bit of the piece, the ultimate, you know, real magic is when we go along with Ian's emotional journey and how we're doing that in our own brains essentially is imagining what it would be like if we were the ones going through that journey and that's how it can bind us together. 
Wow, what a wonderful introduction. I wish I could have you at all of my concerts. <laughs> you can. <laughs> so if, 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 if you'd like, I'll play for you this piece that I spoke about earlier, this concert etude by Liszt. Now, I talked a little bit about Liszt and his flamboyant, virtuoso personality and how he was really a product of the Romantic era and what that means. And I talked a little bit about how this etude is fixated on arpeggios that ripple up and down the piano, using all 10 of my fingers to, to be involved in up and down the piano. But I didn't tell you about the most crucial element, which is a melody. You know, our, our, our ears are trained to pick out a melody like a song. And Liszt has a very direct and beautiful melody. I can play it with my five fingers. It's just those five notes. The problem is my five fingers, in fact, all 10 of my fingers are already occupied. They are busy doing all of these arpeggios. So Liszt adds a third line of music on the top with this melody. And the first question you have when you see this as a pianist, well, the first thing you do is you probably curse and you say, why did I pick this piece? I only have two hands. I don't have a third hand. You're not supposed to use your nose, you're not supposed to use your foot, but instead there is a kind of acrobatic effect of your hands dancing back and forth in order to do both the arpeggios and the melody. Um, before I perform, I'll just demonstrate, excuse me, I'll just demonstrate what I, uh, what I mean slowly so you can see. Later, it'll get more difficult. So this is just a wonderful element to the music because on the one hand, it's just murmuring, rippling harmonies and a very simple melody. On the other hand, it is incredibly technically difficult and acrobatic thing going on. On the one hand, it is a flamboyant concert piece, you know, that this romantic character created. On the other hand, it's an etude. It's a piece of homework for a musician like me to stay at home and practice and get better. And all of that comes together in this beautiful piece. It's about five minutes long. Shall we? All right, if you want, you can even spotlight me if you want to blow up the screen. Thank you. 
Bravo, Ian. And I just want to comment on that little improvisation that you inserted in the middle. <laughs> do you always do that, some kind of an inserted improvisation? I try to. You know, people talk about how Liszt was such a master improviser and how at his concerts, people said the best part of his performance was when he improvised. And it's so sad because, of course, that's the one thing that now we have no access to because there were no recordings. So... Um, I think, uh, you know, so often in classical music, people don't, uh, 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 they don't assume some improvisation will happen, but I think for this piece, the spirit is just right for a little, a little touch of it. And I commend you for that because I do that same thing. <laughs> fantastic. So thank you so much, Ian, for a fantastic performance, putting everything, uh, into music, what we've been talking about this whole hour. So final comment, Indre, please tell us what's your next book going to be about? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. Right now I'm working on a series of lectures for the great courses called The Creative Brain. Um, and that's going to go into studio in December, I believe. So I'm really interested in looking at creativity from a kind of you know, performative perspective and, and, and what we can learn about how, you know, we can be creative. It's not something that we're just born with. So that I think maybe there'll be something there. Um, but I'm also working on a project that's going to launch in September, which is I'll be the host of the new Oliver Sacks podcast. Um, and so I've been working with a story team there. And so, you know, it's possible that there might be something there where, you know, we, we, we say basically that um, we're going to be exploring the human brain one person at a time. And I think that's a, a different approach to, to, to the brain, but I think it's one that, you know, really speaks to me. Okay, fantastic. So let's take a look at how we can buy the book again. So it's offered by Chronicle Books, How Music Can Make You Better, $12.95. Very easy to get at chroniclebooks.com. And let's take a look at the Sound Health Network. Indre, this is one of your, uh, another one of your uh, initiatives. Please tell us a little yeah, bit about so, Yeah, so in January, I was brought on as the new communications director for the Sound Health Network. And this is um, a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts and UCSF. And it's in collaboration with Renee Fleming, um, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and the NIH. And it basically brings together people that are interested in promoting research and public awareness of the impact of music on our health. You know, for a long time, uh, sound health was really siloed in, in many different areas. Um, and now the goal is to bring 
bring everyone who's interested in this together. Um, so there's a clearing house there where you can get uh, access to all kinds of scientific publications, outlining the impact of music on our health and wellness. There are grant opportunities. So if you're interested in doing your own research, um, you can get funding for it. We have monthly webinars that I host um, on different topics. And then those are followed up by a journal club, which is a little bit more kind of research oriented. Um, so next year, uh, we plan to expand the network. And, um, and and my goal is to make sure that, you know, people know about it and that we bring this information about just the fascinating ways in which music can help us um, to the general public. Fantastic. Okay, so that's sound health.ucsf.edu. Now, yeah. and we'll take a look at Indre's website. So indreviscontas.com. And we can contact you. Uh, the, our participants can contact you through mm -hmm. this website, Indre. Yep, that goes straight to my main email account. So okay, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Everyone just has to fill out this form. And yeah, but don't go to my office at USF because it's closed. Okay, got it, okay. <laughs> So that's indreviscontas.com once again. Yeah. And let's take a look at Ian Scarf's website. There it is, ianscarf.com. That's, and... that's mine. That's a picture of the new album that I have just released. Um, and that is me with my ponytail and my tuxedo holding a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> that's reason enough to get it. Okay. So in the contact form, Ian, we can, uh, we can reach out to you by using this contact form? Absolutely, thank you. Fantastic, and tell us you have, this is the Trinity Alps Chamber Music Festival, you're music director of this, and this right, is- Right, that's um, one of the main ways that I've been sharing music through the pandemic. We've been doing concerts on Zoom. Um, we did, we've done already uh, about 30 of these concerts featuring uh, dozens of, of musicians from around the world, including European countries. And uh, hopefully soon we'll be resuming in-person concerts uh, throughout California and the Western United States. Um, so yes, you're welcome to join the mailing list. No matter where you live, you will be able to tune in to our digital concerts. If you're in California, maybe we'll see you in person. Fantastic. And I just want to say, you know, one of the reasons that I think it, um, Ian's work is so impactful is that he takes music to places where music isn't usually found. Uh, so a lot of his work is to bring it to nursing homes and other care facilities where people who have mobility issues um, can then get these wonderful live experiences of music and to places like Palm, Humboldt County, uh, California, which is the most rural county in California. And like, you know, it's not just to the people that there, but he does school shows for kids who, you know, have to get on a bus for an hour every day to get to school, you know, and they get, you know, Ian Scarf and his full, you know, consortium of musicians who are just world-class uh, coming and playing for them. And I just think that that's really remarkable and magical and important and I just want to commend Ian for continuing to serve these underserved populations. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much to Professor Indre Viscontas. Thank you very much, Ian Scarf. Thanks so much for having us. Yes, it's been a pleasure. So let's take a look at next week. Roberto Genova, a message of hope from Bergamo. Before 2020, the Italian city of Bergamo was most renowned for the Città Alta, a medieval fortress built into a steep hill that towers over the city and defended it from foreign invaders. After years of a nonstop international career, Roberto Genova, a saxophonist and conductor, settled down in that city and dedicated his time to sharing his hard-won knowledge with the students of the Liceo Musicale di Bergamo. What he didn't expect from his new life was that he and his students would represent Bergamo's shining face of hope during one of the city's darkest moments. Come welcome Roberto to our show and get to know what musical heroism is all about. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmoro.com. So that's next Wednesday, Roberto Genova, a message of hope from Bergamo. So um, before we go, I just like to uh, apologize to our Facebook Live uh, participants because of some technical issue. The Facebook Live was not uh, working until halfway through the show. So I apologize about that. Uh, I'll contact Zoom and Facebook about that and 
we don't expect to have similar problems next Wednesday. So once again, thank you to Professor Indre Viscontas. Thank you very much to Ian Scarf. Thanks to Professor Lino Rivera. And of course, thanks most of all to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria and from the Bay Area, California, goodbye and see you next Wednesday. Thanks again, bye-bye. Okay, we're all done. Thank you.